But tonight, we get to talk about the nervous system. And we've already had um, worked our way through a couple different levels of division. Uh, we had the primary <laughs> subdivisional anatomy of the central nervous system, which is brain, the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which are all the other nerves that extend out of the spinal cord and out of the brain itself into the periphery or uh, into the other tissue. Um, for the peripheral nervous system, we had a second layer of division, and it was based off of what the nerve did. If it was picking up information from the internal or external environment, it was sensory. If it was picking up information, or I'm, I'm sorry, if it was sending out information to a gland or a muscle, it was a motor neuron. We also had a third level or layer of detail here. And we call that the tertiary division. So you'll remember that sensory we called afferent and motor we called efferent. We have a tertiary division for both the afferent and the efferent neurons. Okay, so both afferent and efferent are going to be divided up into a third or tertiary division. And we are going to refer to them as somatic. And the somatic portions of the nervous system go from and to the limbs and surface anatomy. So arms, musculature, and vasculature, and lymphatics of the limbs, and then also surface structures all over the body. Okay, so literally, somatic means to the body. What does that say? Both afferent and efferent divided by regions or into regions, the tertiary division. The first region is somatic. Now, we've looked at what are known as somatic reflexes already. And so a somatic reflex, just to kind of break this down, a somatic reflex such as the uh, the patellar tendon, the, the patellar tendon reflex or the knee jerk reflex, you have a somatic sensory neuron that interfaces with the Golgi tendon organ in the tendon, the patellar tendon. As the tendon stretches, that signal is sent back into the spinal cord. That neuron that takes the information from the Golgi tendon organ of the tendon of the patellar tendon and goes back to the uh, spinal cord is going to be a somatic afferent with an A peripheral nervous system neuron. Okay? Then we go through a central nervous system neuron. It's going to be called an inner neuron, basically what's happening in the spinal cord that interfaces now with a neuron that's going to send a signal back out to the muscles. And there's actually a couple neurons that are involved. You have one that goes and says to the quadriceps, hey, you need to uh, you need to contract because the tendon is uh, extending at a super big rate, so we want to make sure we shorten that up, and then we also want to uh, inhibit the hamstring from contracting so that the knee can jerk out and shorten the tendon. So those neurons that are bringing signals back out to the muscles, those are going to be uh, somatic motor neurons or somatic efferent neurons of the peripheral nervous system. Okay, you see how all of this kind of works out? That whole arc that I've just described from Golgi tendon organ through our sensory neuron, through the spinal cord, out to our motor neuron is called a somatic reflex or a somatic arch. 
<clears throat> the second division is the visceral division. <clears throat> The visceral di division is going to be the neurons that go from and to what are known as the visceral organs. And these are going to include the organs like the heart and the liver, the urinary bladder, etc. So somatic out to muscles of the limbs and all of the other tissues of the limbs, arms and legs, and then surface structures, and then visceral is going to be everything that's kind of within the core of the body, what we refer to as our visceral organs. Now this visceral side of the nervous system, it's actually going to be further divided up. So just before I go on, I guess... Um, you know, we're going to have uh, visceral reflexes as well. One of them is the neurological control over blood pressure. And so we have neurons that uh, innervate on specialized structures in the vasculature that are, some of them are uh, called the aortic bodies, some of them are called the carotid bodies. They're chemoreceptors and they're baroreceptors. They keep track of the chemical makeup of the blood, and they also keep track of the pressure of the blood. They are innervated by a visceral afferent neuron. And so that information from the internal condition of the blood is brought back into the central nervous system. Uh, typically, these go back into the brain to higher brain centers. And then from the higher brain centers, we have some endocrine stuff that happens, but we also have neurons that come back out to other parts of the body. So if I want to decrease blood pressure, one of the ways that I can do that is to increase, uh, well, really to decrease vascular tone, increase the diameter of the vessels. And so I can send out through a visceral um, somatic, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, visceral efferent neuron, I can send out signals to the smooth muscles surrounding the cell wall or the uh, vessel wall of a um, uh, of a vessel and it causes it to, to increase in diameter. Okay, so that whole thing there would be a visceral reflex. The <clears throat> visceral motor division, so these are all of the neurons that innervate any of our visceral tissues and have a motor a motor function. So these are not going to be uh, any of our sensory neurons. These are just simply going to be um, what is sending information back out to the visceral organs. And that's the visceral motor division. The visceral motor division has another name. So aka also known as the autonomic nervous system. And that's going to just simply be abbreviated the ANS. Now, for the most part, our autonomic nervous system, this visceral motor division, this is under non-voluntary control. Okay, so typically this is under non-voluntary control. And what that means is when we need to, the, the heart, for example, the heart, we're going to learn this uh, in AMP2, is what's known as autorhythmic, or uh, also can be referred to as self-propagating. In other words, the heart generates its own beat and um, it sets an intrins intrinsic rhythm right around 60 beats. You don't need any sort of nervous system activity to do that. So literally, you can dissect out the cells of the heart, you can put them into a petri dish, and they'll begin to contract on their own because they're autorhythmic. They also act in a sensation, which means they'll begin to link up and they'll be very systematically and together. Okay. But if I want to change the characteristics of the heartbeat, such as increase the contraction strength or increase the speed or the rate of the heartbeat, then I need nervous system innervation. That's going to be a visceral motor neuron that's going to help to regulate contraction strength and the speed of the heart. 
So this is not under voluntary control. Right now you're sitting here and you're not thinking about, okay, I need my heart to beat at 75 beats per minute to maintain adequate blood flow to all of my tissues. So because of the autonomic nervous system, we don't need to tell the heart to beat or how fast and how hard to beat. We don't need to tell our lungs and our respiratory muscles when to contract to create uh, a breath of air in. <clears throat> these are what are properly, and I've already sort of described one of these already with the blood pressure example, but these are going to be what we would call visceral reflexes. Now, to make things just even a little bit more complicated, this autonomic nervous system has two additional divisions. We're like down to about like the fifth or sixth level of division here within the nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has two opposing branches or two opposing divisions or let's call them systems. These two opposing systems, one is called the sympathetic. And what the sympathetic nervous system is going to do, so this is a division of the autonomic nervous system. You don't really have any control over this. And that sympathetic nervous system is going to arouse the organism for some sort of action. Sorry, it's got you! <laughs> I just turned on your sympathetic. <laughs> that was so good. Everybody was like, Whoop! <laughs> So what just happened? Heart rate's up. Headache. Breathing rate probably just jumped a little bit. Okay, headaches probably because you're dehydrated or have some other uh, pathophysiological condition. Maybe you're dying. I don't know. Um, <laughs> So you were just preparing, I scared you, and you were just preparing to take some sort of corrective action or either run away or, I mean, in most of your cases, you probably were reaching down and grabbing a knife and pick up in your sock. You know, you shank me. So sympathetic arouses the organism for action. You had absolutely no control over that situation. I mean, some of you were harder to see our brains filling up. Or you might have known that something was coming. I don't know. Because you didn't jump so much. Andrew just took his face and was like, <laughs> and if you were listening, uh, if you were listening close enough, you would have heard a small three-year-old girl scream. And it was Andrew. <laughs> okay. What's the opposite of the sympathetic? It's called the parasympathetic. And right now, you are all slipping back into the parasympathetic control. This is going to calm the body. <clears throat> I wish I had a little camera that just filmed everything so I could put that on the video so we can really have a practical demonstration. But over here on this figure, if you look, there's um, the two divisions, parasympathetic and sympathetic. And we could just go right down this list, and these would be all of the things that ha just happened when I scared you. Your pupils dilated a little bit. We inhibited saliva production. We dilated the bronchioles. We accelerated the heart rate, so on and so forth, all the way down. Basically preparing the organism to get rid of things that are going to be worthless. If you do have to fight or you do have to run away, why should we expend energy on things like saliva production when you don't really need saliva to either punch me in the face or run away from me really fast? Uh, probably don't want to uh, make urine, so we're going to inhibit urination. <laughs> Just not really needed. <laughs> On the other side, uh, parasympathetic, as the system calms down, the threat has gone away. We have everything that's kind of undone, so it constricts the pupils. We're going to stimulate saliva production. You can constrict the bronchioles. Heart rate begins to slow down. Um, how many of you now have to pee because urination, urine production has just increased once again? Uh, and also, we've lifted the sympathetic signal that says, nope, you don't have to pee right now, you have to run away. There's going to be like a drove of like four of you get up in about 10 minutes. 
Gosh, I really got to pee. <laughs> Okay, so that's where we're going to stop with uh, the divisions of the nervous system. Make sure you know all of those and can maybe somehow, I don't know, diagram those out. What I'd like to talk about now is the neuron. The neuron is the cell of the nervous system. And when I say that, that's not entirely true. It's probably better to say that it is the main cell of the nervous system because there are some other cells that help to support the nervous system function, but in reality it all comes down to what the neurons do. The other cells are supporting the neurons so the neuron function as it's intended to. So the first thing I'd like to do is take a look at some of the physiological functions. And in rea all reality, you actually know a lot of the physiological functions because they are very similar to the properties of other cells. But there is one minor difference. It is a higher order or higher magnitude. So one characteristic that you'll remember from all the different cell types that we've already talked about is cells can be excited and they can respond to a stimuli. Neurons can do this as well, but they do it so well that they respond much more efficiently and robustly compared to, say, the cells of the digestive system. So they are very excitable, and they are very responsive to stimuli. Neurons are also really good at passing information forward. We're going to call that conductivity. In fact, they are so good at it that a molecule, a class of molecules, has been named neurotransmitters because of how well they pass information along. So in addition to conductivity and information between two points or two different neurons or two different cells, the neurons are really good at passing electrical signals along their own cells. So they pass electrical signals along and between cells. So along themselves and between others. They're also very good at secretion, extension of conductivity to release neurotransmitters. So not only do they have neurotransmitters that have the information of the signal, they're really good at releasing those transmitters and they're almost exclusively releasing those neurotransmitters by exocytosis. skip this part just to kind of keep you in mind here so you should have C would be your next little section there and I'm realizing now that it's a little bit redundant so just trying to keep you in order here C you're not going to have just skip C and we'll start with D and we're going to go with neuron structure.
So here's a pretty um, weak picture of a neuron, but it's a stereotypical neuron. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about variation here in just a second. But um, anatomically, the big take-home message here for neuron structure is you have three different parts. You have the cell body, which is typically referred to the cell body. And the cell body or the soma is where we're going to contain uh, the nucleus and also we're going to have these finger-like projections or these projections that are called dendrites and these are going to be the portion of the neuron that receive signals from other cells so if we were to zoom in on one of these dendrites what we would see is something very similar to what we've already seen. That's terrible. That's a terrible picture. Let's try that again. With the neuromuscular junction, so this would be the dendrite on this side. This would be the axon and the synaptic bulb on this side. So this is going to be our point of interface. And we're going to have uh, it's not a neuromuscular junction, but we're going to have a, a junction. And it could be a neuron-neuron junction, um, uh, or it could be, well, in this case, yeah, it's going to be a neuron-neuron junction once we get down to the other end where we have our axon terminals, and it can be a neuron to another tissue, neuromuscular junction or a neurodigestive cell junction. The third, or the second section, is going to be called the axon. And you'll notice that this is a long thread-like <laughs> filament. Um, in this case, this is a specific type of axon. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about myelin, the myelin sheath, myelin sheath and nodes of RAND DA and the Schwann cells. The axon is just simply going to be the um, portion of the neuron that transmits the signal. In a lot of ways, this is kind of like the wires that transmit the signal when you flip the switch on, when you flip a light switch on. This is what moves the electrons from the power plant to your light bulb. So it transmits the signal. And then at the very end, we have this last structure here. Now, this last structure actually goes by a variety of names. In the picture, it's called the axon terminal. I've heard it referred to as the terminal arborization. If you haven't picked up on it yet, it's probably because your lap is a little bit weak, but we're using several tree references here, the dendrites, science of uh, aging trees, it's dendrology, arborization, you may recognize Arbor Day Society, and these are referencing that they're branch-like structures, okay, so they have branches like trees. Um, the very tips of the axon terminals or the terminal arborization, the very ends, this is where our synaptic, oh, let's try that over. This is where our synaptic bulb or synaptic knob or our synapse, this is where, this is where these are going to be located. So in the figure you're looking at here, you have the soma, the axon, and then the axon terminal, the terminal arborization. But in all reality, there are actually variations. What we were just looking at is a multipolar 
neuron. But notice that we have a diff couple different types uh, of other neurons. So just to kind of break this figure down, the multipolar, which is the most commonly referred and also the most uh, biologically um, relevant neuron, you have just a single axon and then multiple dendrites. We're referring to it as multipolar because you have two poles and multiple dendrites. Poles in the terms of the opposite sides of the um, the opposite sides of the Opposite sides of the object are different, just like on the quote, we have the north and south pole. I don't know why that was so hard. Bipolar. You can see an example of bipolar here, where the axon, uh, or I'm sorry, the um, soma is in the middle, and we have one dendrite and one. Unipolar, there's actually really only one segment here. You don't have, so here with the multipolar, you have little branches that come off of the soma here and you in this case have five of them and then you have the much longer branch of the axon here bipolar you have a branch in one direction a branch in the other direction here you don't really have you have one long continuous branch with the axon terminals and then right on either side so the, 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 the soma itself isn't in the middle with the branches coming off of it in fact it's kind of on its own little tiny branch right there so that's going to be unipolar. So we have that single process. That's leading from the soma. And then our last example here is an exonic. And axonic. And this just literally means no axon. A N anaerobic without oxygen and axonic without an axon. So this is only dendrites. Basically, the soma with just the dendrites, and we don't have any axon that comes off. Now, as you're observing this axon here, or these different types of axon, most of them, you have a lot of stuff that's going on down here in the synapse or up here in the dendrites. And in some cases, the axon and the axon terminals and the dendrites are pretty far away from the soma where the nucleus is. And here, here, here arises a problem, right? The nucleus is where, I'm, I'm sorry, the soma is where the nucleus is, the nucleus is where the DNA is stored. That information is what gives rise to proteins. Proteins are required for physiology at either end of a multipolar neuron or any of these other examples. So I need proteins down here, but I have the genetic information for proteins up here. In other words, I have to be able to efficiently and quickly transport proteins from the soma down to the very ends of both the dendrites and the axon. So we have a series of mechanisms called axon transport that facilitate this process. So what you're looking at in this figure, this is just a piece of the axon. Uh, proximal 
we're going to have the proximal end being the soma, the distal end being down towards the terminal arborization. Now, this is not the same as the transport or the movement, I should say, of the electrical signal that is sent between two different parts of the neuron. This is movement of other materials. Uh, the other thing, too, is I may have waste products that I need to move back up to the soma where there are other organelles that can handle the waste. So the soma is what contains the organelle. That's where I'm going to find the nucleus. That's where I'm going to find most of my other pieces of equipment that help to sustain uh, the function of the cell. So proteins, they are going to be generated in the cytosol of the soma from the genetic information held inside of the nucleus and have to be transported to the synapses, down to each of those synaptic uh, terminal ends. So I'm going to need things like snaps and snares that help to facilitate the docking of the vesicles containing the neurotransmitter. I'm going to need my calcium channels, all of those types of things. These structures here, these are what are known as cytoskeletal fibers. You know that we have a cytoskeleton. It gives us the structure. It's, they're proteins that help to support the cell. Now, in the axon of a neuron, we have long lengths of these fibers, microtubules and neurofilaments. So these are basically monorails, proteinaceous monorails. On those proteinaceous monorails, we have two different types of motor proteins. Motor because they can move, but to move, they require an ATP supply. They interact with these microtubules and these neurofilaments to be able to catalyze ATP and literally walk down those neurofilaments and those microtubules, carrying whatever debris or products, whatever they need. So if I need a bunch of proteins, I'll package those proteins up from the Golgi complex in a vesicle, hand them over to one of these motor proteins, and those motor proteins will just begin to walk their way down the axon. Now think about axons. How long are axons? A typical axon. It may actually be pretty long. On me, I have a, a single neuron, and actually I have multiple neurons that run from my spinal cord all the way down to inductor halicus in my toe. That's probably about a meter and a half. The soma is up here. I have to transport the required proteins down to the axon to help function my big toe. We transport proteins, pack them up into a vesicle, put them onto, uh, or give them to a motor protein, and we move them along. And since we're moving them from proximal to distal, this occurs in an anterograde mechanism, or anterograde transport, which just simply means you're going to recognize the other term, it's retrograde, which would be going backwards. Interrograde means going forward. So we um, use interrograde transport to send things down to the synapse. We do generate waste both down at the synapse and also all along the axon that needs to be brought back up to the soma. So for our waste products from places like the synaptic knob back to the soma, we are going to use retrograde. Retrograde transport. So interrograde from soma to synapse, from synapse to soma is retrograde. 
And we're going to get into just a little bit more detail of each of these different parts, and also we're going to talk a little bit about speed here uh, as well, once everybody has this. Everybody good? Okay, so there are those cytoskeleton fibers, and I liken them already to monorails. And so these are just simply going to be the filaments that basically allow the path. And then we're going to have these different motor proteins that will walk along this rail. In the interrograde direction, the protein is called kinesin. And the kinesins um, are what bring everything down from the soma to the synapse. And then we have dynin, and this is going to be our retrograde motor protein. Okay, so the cytoskeletal fibers are the monorail, or the, the rail of the monorail, and then in the anterograde direction we have this motor protein called kinesin, and in the retrograde we have this motor protein called dynin. Now, transport can occur in two ways. It can either occur fast or it can occur slow. Fast axonal transport is actually going to occur in both directions. So we can transport things down to the synapse or back up, and it occurs fast. Well, how fast is fast in terms of axonal transport? The range is between 20 and 400 millimeters in a 24-hour period. So between 20 and 400 millimeters per day. This is coming up pretty close to half a meter. So if I have a neuron that's a meter and a half, it's going to take about three days at the absolute maximum speed. Uh, this fast axonal transport in the retrograde, the retro is going to provide the soma. It's going to also bring information, not just waste material, but information on the synapse condition. So maybe there's some new proteins that are required. That information gets relayed back up to the synapse or to the soma. The nucleus will churn those uh, messenger RNA, RNAs out, ribosomes produce the proteins, they get packaged up and sent down to the synapse. Now the other uh, speed is to go slow, but don't uh, don't let this fool you. Um, because really, in all, it, when the motor protein is in use and it's moving, it's actually just as fast as the fast axonal transport. The difference is, is that it stops along the way, kind of like a bus doing its bus route, and it stops at bus stops. This only occurs in the interrogrid direction. has that stop and go progression. Now, with this stop and go progression, this allows service all along the axon as well. So we're not just sending 
material from the soma down to the synapse, we can actually manage the axon as well. So even though it's slower than fast axonal transport, when it is actually go and not stop, it moves as fast. So we move as fast as fast transport. So that means that it has a speed of 20 to 400 millimeters per day. However, because it stops frequently, taking everything in average, we really only make it between 0 0.5 and 10 millimeters per day. Does everybody kind of understand what I'm saying there? So when it's, when it's in motion, when we're go in our stop and go progression, 20 to 400 millimeters per minute, but we'll only go short amount of distance between two different parts of the axon. And so we're going to progress very slowly in relative terms.